our business went through the roof. Uh, people were, uh, I mean, we, we never had so many leads for outdoor living spaces. It was just absolutely crazy. My eyes were, of course, completely opened up to the opportunity or the possibilities that come along with syndicating a deal and being able to have um, a slice of a million dollar property or a million dollar plus property, I should say. We purchased our first property within, oh, I think it was like seven months after we formed and it was uh, 70 units in Wichita, Kansas. Hey guys, this is Sharad with Resimply, host of the Resimply podcast, bringing you a very special guest, Beth Underhill on this podcast. Beth, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Our pleasure. Beth, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? What kind of investing do you do or your real estate background? Sure, absolutely. So I live in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, with my husband, uh, my 20-year-old daughter who attends the University of Kentucky and four dogs. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Busy household. Uh, what's that? Busy household. Oh, it is a busy household. The dogs keep us on our toes all the time. Sure. But uh, we've always had a ton of dogs. My husband and I have had 12 dogs uh, between us since we've been together for 25 years. So yeah. Anyway, so I started my real estate uh, investing career or journey, I should say, in 2018. My husband, who doesn't always necessarily get the, the best sleep, happened to be up in the middle of the night listening to an infomercial about fixing and flipping single family homes. And he signed us up for um, a one day wonder event, as I call it. Uh, that we ended up attending in September of 2018. And that led to a three-day event that led to a five-day bus tour um, out in San Diego, California. We came home. We immediately started searching for houses to flip and partnered up with some investors. Um, and that's what really got us into real estate. And then fast forward to 2020 and COVID hits, right? Uh, my husband and I, we own an outdoor living space construction company and our business went through the roof. Uh, people were, uh, I mean, we, we never had so many leads for outdoor living spaces. It was just absolutely crazy. Everyone knew that, um, Hey, you know what, if I'm going to be able to social distance, or if I want to be around family and friends, I need someplace outdoors that I can socialize with them. So our business went nuts. And that's when we decided to kind of pull the reins back on the fixing and flipping because we were just handling too much at that time. And that's when I pivoted actually into commercial real estate. So I attended an event on multifamily syndication and my eyes were of course completely opened up to the opportunity or the possibilities that come along with syndicating a deal and being able to have a slice of a million dollar property or a million dollar plus property, I should say. Shortly after that, I just started doing some networking with people through Facebook, different groups and so forth. And I happened to meet um, a group of gentlemen who were forming a new entity and they were going to take down multifamily properties, but they needed some help, someone who could help with marketing and investor relations. So I offered my services to be able to do that. And uh, that turned into ownership of the company. We purchased our first property within, oh, I think it was like seven months after we formed. And it was uh, 70 units in Wichita, Kansas. And then we pivoted because we brought somebody onto the team who had 17 plus years in student housing experience. We pivoted into the student housing um, niche of multifamily. And so we've been acquiring student housing properties ever since. Wow. You've been pretty busy since 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's and are you, so you're not doing any residential, it's all student housing now? Student housing now. We just have that one multifamily property and then four student housing properties and searching for more all the time. But no, I am, I am not involved in any residential projects. Oh, and are you, what are you buying these properties? Uh, primarily in the Southeast. So okay. we have one property that is in um, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. And then three that are in Georgia. Perfect. It's so interesting that you're one of the very few people that I've heard a success story from actually watching the infomercial. Did you guys actually have any interest in real estate or it was really just, 
your husband happened to watch an infomercial about flipping. He's like, hey, let's just go attend this seminar. Or you guys had been thinking about real estate. So you would, you do you still have the construction company? We do, we do. Okay, mm -hmm. and that yeah. that's what you guys were doing full-time, the outdoor construction company. Correct. Um, and then did you yeah. always have an interest in real estate investing or just happen to really watch the information and it was so good that you had to attend? Well, uh, truth be told, so, you know, my husband and I actually, both houses that we've lived in, we purchased through creative financing. So okay. we always, you know, had a level of interest in back in, I think it was around 2005 or so, we had looked at purchasing a franchise, a real estate franchise and called Help You Sell. And the franchise model was such that they would help buyers to market their properties and, and put the property on the MLS for just a flat fee so that the buyer could save on the buyer side and not actually have to pay the commission to a realtor. Um, and then we'd only have to pay the, um, well, uh, I'm sorry. So the seller, the I'm seller, sorry, side, the seller yeah. would only have to, I'm sorry about that. The seller so, would be able to list the property on their platform and on the MLS, and they would not have to pay the seller's commission, but only just the buyer's commission. So oh, wow. we had considered that. And I started going down the path of getting my real estate license. And then I'm not sure exactly like what happened, um, but life happened clearly because I still don't recall why we abandoned the whole idea, but we did. So, so yeah, that was something that we just walked away from. Now, throughout our entire um, life of owning our outdoor construction company, we had always talked about purchasing a house during the winter months to actually bring our, our crew inside, as opposed to having them work outdoors and have them work indoors in order to um, not subject them to the cold temperatures. And we thought, oh gosh, if we could find a house and have them flip a house somewhere between the end of December all the way through about mid-February, that would be ideal. Because really those are those are the times that we experience the coldest temperatures here in Cincinnati. Otherwise, I mean, we could almost work outdoors almost 12 months out of the year. But we, we were never able to find a house, A, and B, we were always too busy that it was hard to take our okay. guys and say, okay, we're going to take a crew, put them inside when we always had book business. And then we just managed to figure out how to actually construct our outdoor living spaces. We would build tents with heaters underneath and so forth. And that seemed to work for our guys. And, and so we, we pretty much abandoned that idea as well. So when the opportunity came around, when he saw this, this uh, infomercial, he thought, you know what, like, you know, we love our outdoor construction business, but we also knew that this was a really great opportunity and a way for us to take our skills that we, you know, had worked so dearly on outdoors and utilize those and, and put them to work inside. So, well, it opened up another avenue of of opportunity for us. It also added another layer of, right. you know, jobs and work and so forth on an existing uh, busy schedule already. So it just didn't make a whole lot of sense as we started <laughs> kind of going through it. I mean, we both were, were just fried, you know? And, right. and so we decided, you know, really once COVID hit, I mean, well, I shouldn't say we decided, but once COVID hit, it made the decision for us. We knew we had to focus on our bread and butter and what we were experts at, as opposed to something that we were, you know, sort of okay at. Yeah. And yeah. Thus, I made the pivot into the commercial space. Got it. And then in the commercial space, so you said, did you start going to local RIAs? Is that how you found this network of investors? How did you go about finding these uh, investors that you're currently working with? Sure. So um, I started networking on Facebook, actually, joined some Facebook groups, um, started meeting Like local people. Cincinnati Facebook group or like nationwide? No, nationwide Facebook groups. Okay. Nationwide Facebook groups. Yeah. Ironically, it's funny because the three partners who started the company, one's from New York, one's in South Carolina, and the other one is in Florida. And that just is, you know, the power of networking through social okay. media, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but I did, I did join our local RIA and I, I started meeting, you know, local real estate investors as well. But I ended up, what happened was I, um, I had signed up for an event in Orlando, um, a Rod Khalif event. I don't know if you've heard of Rod Khalif or not. Yes, 
But okay, so I signed up for one of his events and that is where I met the three of them in person. I had already spoken with one of them um, on the phone several times. And um, and I told him, I, I had pinged him and I said, hey, I know you're in Florida and I'm gonna be attending Rod Khalif's event. You know, are you planning to attend that? And I was kind of, you know, I was green to the, to the, the business, the industry and so forth. And I thought everybody attended these events, right? I didn't know like that there's so many events that are held all the time and you can't, you can't hit them all. Um, but he said, Hey, you know what? I'll, I'll plan to meet you there. I'll go up and meet you there. Well, little did he know that the other two partners that, you know, they had been talking and so forth that they were planning to be at that same event. So there happened to be one day when the three of them were together, they were having lunch. I happened to walk by the table and the one partner said, Hey, Beth, come over here. I want you to meet, I want you to meet the other two partners and, and let's sit down and all have lunch together. So we had lunch together. And from there, um, they really liked me. I liked them. Um, and they said, yeah, Beth, we, we just need some help. And, you know, ironically, you know, they were, you know, three gentlemen, and I think they were looking for, you know, that kind of, I don't want to say that female side of things, but also that person who, you know, I was like, I love talking to investors. I love dealing with back office stuff. I love dealing, you know, all the things that they did not want mm. to do. They're like, we don't, we don't, de you know, we don't like that. And I said, great. I said, I'll be part of this. So, um, so anyway, so we started off the four of us and then slowly, but surely we added two more team members to our organization. And one in particular happened to be um, the gentleman who's got the 17 plus years um, experience in student housing. So he's guided us fantastic through that particular niche. It's been a wonderful experience, something that I didn't think I was really, you know, going to gravitate towards. However, now having, uh, having gone through the experience with my daughter now three years, you know, in college, it, um, I understand the power of student housing student and, housing. uh, and, and I'm in love with, I'm in love with that niche. Yeah. What's special about student housing? There's just a natural progression seems to be investors are doing single family, like wholesaling, then they do fix and flip. Mm -hmm. Then they go to smaller multi-units and then eventually they go into bigger multi-units. Like student housing is, is a very, uh, you know, one niche that not many investors get into. And this was after four of you formed a partnership to buy multi-units and you ended up buying a 70 unit in Kansas, mm -hmm. right? And then right. you decided to pivot to student housing. What was it about student housing that you guys decided it made better sense and then when you already bought a 70 unit property? Um, you know, I really, it, it was an opportunity that was presented to us. It was an off market opportunity that the gentleman who had, the partner who had the um, 17 plus years experience brought to the team. Um, and after underwriting it, I mean, this, it was a, a, a great deal, cash flowing deal. 100% pre-leased year over year over year, and the ability to actually push rents um, more so than where they were at because the developer, and we actually purchased this from a developer, so the developer came in, developed the property, leased up, leased up for several years and then decided that they wanted to sell. So we were able to take this over with meat on the bone still. And, you know, when you don't actually have to worry about capital expenditures, you know, huge renovations, and you, you've got a property that has been, you know, has a history of being a hundred percent leased. Um, and, and you know, you can push market rents. It, it was, it was a no brainer. And, um, you know, and we were assuming um, and then icing on the cake, we were assuming a loan at 3.62%. Oh, so, wow. yeah, That's so there incredible. was, there were a lot of positives um, surrounding it. Right. And how has like, in terms of ROI, how is student housing different from large multi-units, like 70, 100 units versus a student housing and the student housing project that you purchased the first one, how many units was that? So that one is 126 beds. So okay. there are, yeah. So student housing goes by the bed. So it's interesting because you have multifamily that's by the unit. You have hotels that are by the keys and then um, student housing is, is by the right. bed. So okay. this one has 126 beds, but it's got 28, 
28 units. Okay. So the 28 units are comprised of, you know, four beds, five beds, six beds, and so forth. So there's just this nice combination. And these were all like cottage style homes, actually. That's what this, this particular, um, this particular property um, was built with these cottage style homes. And they've got these wonderful porches, students love to sit on them, hang out and so forth. But each student actually within the house has their own bedroom, has their own bathroom. Um, and then there's um, a common area with um, living space, um, another half bath, and then a full kitchen. Uh, so this is just like, like it's like your own like it's like walking into your own house is essentially what it is because they're two story um and then just in this nice community that's beautifully landscaped and so forth so so yeah so student housing by the bed that's one of the big differences um you know student housing with student housing most people think that um the leases only run for the academic year, but they're actually 12 month leases. So you're signing a 12 month lease. So you're, you know, just like a, a lease for a multifamily, you're getting that full year. And, and that's a misconception by many, many people yeah, think like, that's, oh, what, well, that's only... what I always thought it was for the school year only. Yeah, no, it's actually for 12 months. So even if you're not going to be there for three months, you're still going to pay rent. So, um, so that's a, that's obviously a, a bonus. Um, and then on top of that, the parents, um, all the parents have to guarantee the leases or there's a guarantor, I should say. So if, if maybe some, you know, could be a, um, a relative or whatnot, but, um, but there is a guarantor on those leases, um, above and beyond just the students themselves. And that is always, um, a plus for us because, if hypothetically Susie damages, you know, a wall, um, mom and dad's credit card or the guarantor's credit card is going to get swiped to, to take care of that. And we are finding most of the, or not most, but all of the properties that we purchase are class A properties. And we do find that the students that are living in these class A pro properties, because they're newer, um, they tend to take care of them. And so we've had minimal, minimal damage over the, the life of what we've owned them so far. Interesting. Do you mind walking through numbers of any of the properties that you purchase? Like what does I'm I'm very curious about what does an ROI on a student housing building looks like versus you know a typical multifamily? And I would imagine because you're renting it out by bed, you're getting higher than market rent on these properties. Is that fair to say? No, not necessarily. We're getting market rent relative to the student housing market. So right. So, so yeah, so other student housing, other purpose-built student housing properties within the area, you know, we look to be, you know, achieving that same market rent that they're achieving, um, mm -hmm. as long as, of course, um, from an amenity standpoint, as long as, you know, we're comparing apples to apples, we don't want to compare apples to oranges. Um, not all of our properties, they're not highly amenitized. Um, you know, there's student housing properties that have, you know, pools that have movie theaters that have all kinds of bells and whistles. Um, the ones that we have specifically do not have bells and whistles. Um, I would say the most highly amenitized one that we have is one in Athens, Georgia that has, it's, it's a mixture of student housing and it also has um, some commercial, a commercial component to it. So we have, um, uh, we've got people that are leasing that, um, leasing for a, a bar, leasing for a froze shop, um, you know, a couple of other retail type establishments, a gym and whatnot. So, so, you know, it, it, it just all depends on the market and where we're at, but we're not leasing market to another multifamily property oh, yeah. it's yeah um but yeah returns on it on, on student housing properties i mean we we shoot for this is what we shoot for all the time an eight percent cash on cash a 2x equity multiple minimum and then a minimum of, of an 18 percent irr so those are our deal metrics that all of our deals right now that we currently are in have met those minimums and some of them have maybe slightly higher higher IRRs or slightly higher 2x equity multiples. I think our highest 2x or our highest equity multiple is maybe like a 2.2 or so. Um, but yeah, so I mean that, that's what we shoot for. And of course, you know, the business plan is to hold on to uh, these properties for five years. 
um, and maybe do some sort of uh, capital event somewhere around year three, you know, and, and the goal, of course, is, you know, finance out the investors as soon as possible, make sure that you return, return their monies, return, you know, get them their return of capital and return on capital, um, because we want them to invest with us again. So as long as we're, we're executing the business plan. Now we've had a lot of great success. The three properties that we have actually leased up for this year, we actually averaged over 9% rent growth with all three properties. Wow. The fourth property Incredible. is, um, we're closing on that shortly, but yes, with the three ones that we had the ability to lease up going into this year, over 9% rent growth. So wow. I think it averaged somewhere around 9.32. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What's the what's the equity multiple? I've never heard that. Oh, okay. So equity multiple is um, essentially what it means is if it's a 2x equity multiple, it means that if you invested $100,000, you're going to double your money. So you're going to get your $100,000 back and then you're going to get $100,000 on top of that. So that's what we shoot for is is basically doubling your money. An equity what, multiple what could be period? two, could be a three. In what time period? Five years. Five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. That's, that's incredible return. And where do you find these properties? I know the first one you found off market through the gentleman that you had hired. What about the other three, two that you've closed and one that you're closing on? Sure. Same pipeline. He just same. has, he has these amazing relationships. He worked for both Dovetail and Landmark Properties. Okay. And, and they are some of the largest student housing property management companies and developers in the country. So in, in addition to that, you know, he just created all kinds of relationships within that, that space. Um, and not just property management, but also brokers. And so, um, so this pipeline has been continual for us. And mm. it's, um, it's just really been, it's been a blessing because there's, there's been so many positives, right? So I told you about the one property with 3.62%, our 252 bed student housing property just outside of Nashville. We assume that with a 4.38% loan and that's good until the end i think it's good until 2030 something like that so so you know yeah. we're just getting a lot of really positive flow of of opportunities and really for us sometimes it's it's not about it's not about finding the deals it's right. just about sourcing the capital um yeah. when it's all said and done is that the biggest challenge you guys have is sourcing the capital and if you have the capital then you have other properties that you can buy Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And and we're working on strategic relationships, partnerships, and so forth with capital allocators, family offices, mm -hmm. you know, family offices specifically that like the student housing niche, you know, just something that, you know, is, is um, over time, you know, it takes, it takes time to cultivate those relationships, right. but, but that's what we're actively pursuing. I mean, we love our retail investors. I mean, they're great. And, and they've been, you know, just so excited about our properties and, and what's been going on with the properties. But, but ultimately when it's, when it's all said and done, you know, the more capital that we have um, to be able to take down some of these amazing opportunities coming our way, the easier it is. Right. And then with the student housing, the way you have hundred percent occupants, the one, uh, the first project that you were talking about, the one that you bought from a builder, do you have any vacancy and, or they're always hundred percent occupied? So if they sign a lease agreement for 12 months, I, I mean, technically, yes, we're a hundred percent occupied and there is no vacancy. Now that's not to say that somebody doesn't move out, you know, maybe after the fall semester for whatever reason, and maybe they decide to move home or, or they have, um, they drop out of school, um, which is fine, but that's still, that lease is still in place and they're still responsible for it. Now, if they decide to break the lease, then obviously there's legal ramifications that, that surround that. And we can actively look for someone else to um, take that space. But, but the fact that they're hundred percent pre-leased, it means that yes, for an entire year, we can expect to have the right. same amount of rental okay. income every single month. And that's, you know, that's of course, unlike multifamily, right? Where it shifts from month to month simply because you have leases that come due and leases that start all at, at different 
Different points times. and periods and so forth. And so some, some months you might have a little bit higher cash flows, whereas some months might be a little bit lower. But th that's the nice thing about um, the student housing is we know exactly what's coming in every single month. Right. That's, that's amazing. So since we are close to the start of a new school year, so your leases go from like August to July or September to August. Is that how it's, it's set up? August to July. Mm -hmm. August to July. And yeah. then people are moving out. And then you would have people sign up 12 monthly, but they're not necessarily staying in these units for 12 months. You know, they might move out at the end of the spring semester. So you have time to go in and get the units ready for the next set of students to come in? Well, as long as they aren't renting it out to anyone. Yes, we, okay. we can do that. But there's what's called this period. And it's generally this period that begins kind of the last couple of weeks of July into the first okay. couple of weeks of August. And it's called term. And okay. that is when like we are able to as long as someone. So if someone has renewed their lease, so let's say they were a sophomore last year and they're renewing their lease, they're going to be a junior this year and they're renewing it. They're just going to stay put. So we don't, right. we don't have to worry about doing anything. But those who are physically moving out will have to move out by July I'm, I'm just going to use a, an arbitrary date, July 20th. And okay. they're gone by July 20th, which allows us, you know, within a three, three and a half, four, no more than four week window. I'm going to say it's probably more like three week window to go in and do whatever is necessary. If it's painting, if it's, you know, replacing any furniture, um, maybe a refrigerator needs to be repaired or, or replaced, you know, things along those lines, you know, but all of that is known ahead of time. So the property management team, what they do is they prepare for this, right? So they've already done you know, kind of a sweep, the actual property itself. And they've made a list, hey, we need to order five new couches, we need to order, you know, 10 new refrigerators. And of course, I'm making up numbers, right? But they'll go through, yeah, yeah. they'll figure yeah. out exactly what needs to be done. And then within this window, you know, it's all hands on board, right? All hands on deck to just go get it done. It, painting, replacing, you name it, and just getting it ready for any incoming students to to move in. I love that. I love that business model. Like you have 12 months of lease and then you, for every building, three that you own and one that you have coming, I would imagine that you already have like two, three months, you know, ahead of time, you have students applying for these units and then you have, uh, you know, if someone is moving out, you already have interest in those vacant units. So you would potentially have, you know, 100% rent coming in. They may or may not be occupied, but you have rent guarantee coming in. I love that. And I, I, I love the, I just, I never thought of it, but it just, it obviously makes sense that all your leases start and end at the same time. Right. So you don't right. have, and then you have this crunch time of mid July to mid August where you just need to turn over the unit, but then you know, okay, this is like, we need all hands on deck. And then outside of that, it, for the most part, pretty smooth sailing, you know, I'm sure there's like tons of issues that you run into, but. Sure. I mean, it, obviously there's going to be things that come up, but, but the nice thing about it is that, you know, like for instance, the turn, like all of that's done at one time. So it's yeah. not where, you know, yeah. if in September you have five units coming coming due or coming, becoming vacant and, you know, got to get your maintenance guy ready to go and, Hey, we need paint and so forth. And then there's 10 units in, in October and, and 12 units in November and three yeah. in December, you know, you can just plan for yeah. this 100%. one period of time. And then it's done in one, one fell yeah. swoop. Now and I will say this about the lease discount week. also, you know, Pardon? because you, I, I said, and also get bulk pricing because you're buying right. everything at one, uh, at one point. Absolutely. Right. Um, now I will say this about leasing. So, you know, so turn is, is, is over and done with, and then, you know, the, the students come back and no sooner did those students come back, we're into September, we're already starting to lease for the following year. I mean, that's just oh, how wow. quickly the kids actually have to think about where they're going to actually live the following year. So it's, it's very interesting. Like my daughter, for instance, so her first year, she was on campus in a dorm. Second year, she was on campus in her sorority house. And now this year, she's actually going to be living off campus in what's called a legacy house. And this particular legacy house, she, her soror the sorority that she's involved uh, with is called Chi Omega. And so this particular house, it's like anybody who's from Chi Omega, like 
you know, kind of transitions there. And so every right. single year, you know, it's sorority girls from Chi Omega who end up living in this off-campus house. Well, this off-campus house only has five bedrooms. So only five girls, of course, are going to live there. But they had to, you know, sign their lease agreement. I think we signed it like last October, November. Wow. I mean, she was already for this year. making plans for this year coming up. Yes. So wow. that's how far in advance. And the same thing with some of our student housing properties. Um, for instance, the, the very first one that I told you, about that has the cottage style um, homes. It's a legacy property as well, too. So there's a lot of uh, uh, students who are part of the Greek community. And so, you know, if you have in like two or three of these cottage style homes, you have, I don't know, maybe 16 girls from one, one particular sorority, you know, they'll tell, you know, the freshman and sophomore, hey, this is where we live. And you ought to think about living here next year. And, and so, right. you know, it just kind of like it's word of mouth transitions that way. And it, it makes our lives really quite easy Absolutely. from the standpoint of leasing them up. So, so some of these properties are leased up a hundred percent by the latest April. So the April going into, you know, that next school year, which is nice because again, you just, you kind of pro push and work towards getting it leased up and, and, and then you just focus on the turn and then you, you just start the cycle all over again. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I never, I I just in my mind I thought dealing with student housing, you know, you're dealing with like these kids who have gained like independence, and then it would be uh, pretty rough managing those units. But it also, I mean, I would imagine it depends on the type of the the class of property that you're buying, right? Class A right. property versus like you know a lower class property would have a different set of uh, students, you know, it may be, or, and then also the age of the building also has something to do with it, where you have uh, not many deferred maintenance. And are, are these buildings that you're buying, are they within walking distance? Is that something you look for that they're within walking distance or a short bike ride or, a, you know, like how far would these properties be from the actual campus? Yep. Great question. We like to find properties that are as close to campus as possible. So one of our properties is 0.3 miles away, which means wow. it's across the street. Um, and uh, so you, you literally like there's a, a street in between our property and then the property okay. line of the campus. And so that's how close that one is. I think our furthest one is less, just slightly less than a mile away. Oh, you can and still walk. We, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and it's in Georgia, right? So yeah. you're not talking about, you know, being up in Minnesota where yeah. it might be, you know, cold, but even still yeah. less than a mile away. Um, in 30 degree temperature is, is yeah. not, yeah, not absolutely. Ideal. Especially college kids. They don't feel, oh, they don't care. Cold. Yeah. No. They don't care. Yeah. Don't care. I love that. I love yeah. that. This is, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm so glad I had this conversation with you. I had no idea about the student housing. I just bought my first, I, I, you know, bought my first 11 unit property, uh, three, four months ago, we're finishing the rehab on it. But up until then, and since then, all we've done is like, single family, you know, one to four units, which we sure. buy, flip. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to a friend of mine that I bought as a partnership with him. And we were talking about looking at other bigger properties to buy. And it just, in, in my mind, the natural progression was buying a multi-unit, but having this conversation with you, it opened my eye to student housing. It's just the fact that you're renting all your units you know, your leases all start and end at the same time. Right. And then you have this, you know, such high demand for these properties that some of them you're renting, signing leases one year before the tenants are going to move in. I think that's an incredible business model. And you know, you know, there's always going to be a demand for these properties. And then you have a guarantor. So I absolutely love that business model. Yep. What's your, yeah. what's, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, that's why, that's why we yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah, I am curious. The person that you hired, the gentleman that you hired, who's helped you buy, you know, get these four properties, did you hire that person with the intention of going into student housing, or it just it was just a coincidence that you ended up hiring this person, and that opened your eye towards student housing investment? So you know, I think you know he he had a relationship with one of the other uh, partners, one of the Got original okay. partners. Okay. And I think that just through um, conversing, it was discussed that, you know, this is 
you know, what he could bring to the table opportunities within the student housing sector. And so we had, had looked at that sector thinking, you know, okay, you know, had no idea how viable it actually is. And of course, too, I mean, one thing I will say, you know, especially post COVID, um, you know, universities have, have fluctuated in terms of enrollment. And one of the things that we look for is of course, you know, universities or, or top tier colleges where, there's a draw, there's an attraction. So like the University of Georgia is, you know, where we have one of our properties, right? University of Georgia has been on everyone's radar, especially over the last few years with respect to football. They've been this football powerhouse. And, you know, sometimes kids just decide that they want to go to a college just because they want to root for, you know, the athletic programs and so forth. They're, you know, I'm, I'm in Ohio, right? So Ohio State is a big drop. People just want to be a Buckeye. They've grown up, you know, hearing about Ohio State. Maybe they've um, been rooting for the Buckeyes, you know, with football and, and whatever else. And so they just want to go because they want to be part of something. And so, yeah. um, so you know, we look for those top tier universities that have that draw that we know enrollment is not going to fluctuate. It might fluctuate when you've got an enrollment of, you know, 30,000 that fluctuates by two to 300. That's one thing, you know, but when you have an enrollment of 2000 that fluctuates by that, that's a bigger deal. So, you know, making sure that, you know, the market that you're in is, um, is obviously essential and and key to ensuring that you are going to guarantee yourself that hundred percent, or close to 100% occupancy. Right. So now that you're doing student housing, just looking at, you know, your future goals, two, three, five years down the road, mm-hmm. is that kind of what you want to double down on? Are you looking at other investment asset classes to invest in? Or you're like, hey, student housing is what's working for us. Let's just double down and just keep buying more properties. What, what's your like next three to five year goal? Three to five years um, development. That's okay. where I would, yeah, Student I housing? would like to be. And then some of the team members, um, we all want to be in development. So um, we do have some, or... yeah, maybe, maybe, okay. um, but you know, I have, uh, we all have had some development opportunities presented to us and we're evaluating what makes sense. Um, so it, it could be single family homes. It could be townhomes. It could be student housing, um, retail. Uh, We haven't quite figured out just where that development's going to be, but development is, is definitely, I I would say the three to five year goal. Interesting. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what it seems like a lot of investor want to do. Progression. Yeah. The progression is like Mm -hmm. to develop, you know, create, like take just dirt and just create this amazing beautiful property whether it's single family multi-unit or whatnot um so yeah that's that's amazing but thank you so much for this uh for your time this has been absolutely incredible just a couple of last questions you're super busy you have your own outdoor construction business student housing uh that you're doing and then you're looking at doing some more development you have four dogs what do you do for fun well for fun i love to play golf um oh, nice. tra- travel when i can and then I am a power lifter. So I have been, um, I, I, I've just been involved in that sport for the last nice. ooh, six and a half years now. And I tr- uh, compete on oh, a national cool. and international level. That um, is so cool. That yeah. So, cool. so I, I, I guess you could say that's fun, but you know, it, it kind of serves a couple of different purposes. Number one, it keeps me accountable in the gym. So I like that. Um, and then it, it's also just an avenue that, um, you know, I'm 55 years old, so it gives me an opportunity to just participate in something competitively. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I just enjoy it. I've always loved the power of the barbell. I channel a lot of emotion and energy into the barbell. So it's, uh, it's served me really well over the last six and a half years. It's amazing. Yeah. I started, I've been going to F45. Uh, for last okay. like six months absolutely loved it it's like the best 45 minutes of my day I don't go every day but it just it does the time flies by um, flies by I do weightlifting I do resistance exercise and it makes such a difference you know just mm-hmm. for mentally it gives you so much clarity just to get away so I love that all right next question what's the one book that's had the biggest impact in your life? It could be a business book, it could be a personal book, or it could be one of each. I think it would have to be a book called Prosperity. Prosperity. And 
Prosperity. Mm -hmm. What's the book and about? And I believe it's by Russell Russell Wilson, if I'm not mistaken. Um, oh, the football player? No, no. Okay. okay. <laughs> football player. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it, you know, it it just talks. It it's so much about the power of of you know how you think and and prosperity in your life, not just monetarily, but just prosperity in terms of um, yeah, what you think what you believe, um, who you are, um, how you interact with other people, and just how you view life in general. Yeah. So um, it's faith-based, but I, I do, um, I, I go back to it all the time and yeah. probably like once a quarter, we'll, we'll re-listen to it. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. And final question, if you could spend a day with anyone, dead or alive, who would you want to spend the day with and why? Dead or alive? Well, that's a very tricky question. That is a very tricky question. I think at this point, I mean, I would love to spend, obviously, I would love to spend another day with my parents. Sure. But yes. that aside, I would say Barbara Corcoran. I oh. just absolutely loved her on Shark Tank. We, yeah. I mean, we, you know, in our household, we've been huge fans of, of Shark Tank. And at first, you know, I, I always, you know, as I kind of would listen to all the different sharks and so forth, like I went through my stages of gravitating towards, you know, certain sharks for certain yeah. reasons. Um, you know, you know, Mark Cuban's got this bigger than life personality. It's awesome. You know, Mr. Wonderful. I mean, he just, yeah, I love how everyone makes fun of him and so forth. But I think the fact that Barbara had this, you know, real estate experience, you know, took that thousand right. dollars as she always talks about and turned it into, um, you know, millions and millions, you know, it, to me, that's, that's just a story. I, I just, it's the rags to riches story. It's Absolutely. something that, you know, I feel like, okay, if she can do it, then, then why not me? Yeah, and um, so, you know, I would love to spend a day with her just picking her brain. I think she's amazing. Um, and I, I think the fact that she's in real estate, it's just yeah. inspiring. Absolutely. So. And she seems like a very open person to talk about like whatever she, yeah, I, I read her book when I saw her in Shark Tank, I read her book. Uh, absolutely incredible story she has. Yeah. I bet. And, and she's totally yeah. relatable too. Yeah, you know, she is. She just exactly. seems like someone that you could sit down, have a glass of wine with a cup of coffee, yeah. you know, just have have fun at the same right. time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, 100%. But absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for your time. It, it's been it's been a very, very, uh, you know, resourceful interview for me, for my personal reasons. Like I'm, I'm really curious about student housing. So thank you for that. If someone who's listening to this or watching this wants to connect with you, learn a little bit more about your journey, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. They can reach out to me at uh, Beth at investingwithbeth.com. Um, okay. They can follow me on Instagram. My, my handle there is at investingwithbeth, same on TikTok. Um, LinkedIn, Beth Januzzi Underhill. Um, we can connect there. Um, and yeah, I guess that's yeah. about it. Or you can text me, 513-470-1078. Perfect. We'll put links to all of these in the show notes. Beth, okay. thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me.